Thanks again, everyone, for joining us uh, to talk about the Screen Industry Workers Bill and what it means for contractors in the video game industry. Uh, so I'm Michael Block. Uh, I set up the nzgamedevrights.org website uh, and ran the last panel webinar discussion about a year ago now. Um, and I'll let the uh, rest of the panel introduce themselves. Hi, I'm Chelsea, and I'm the chairperson of the NZGDA, and I'm mostly just here to help uh, manage Q&A during the Q&A session. Kia ora koutou, ko Gayathri tōko ingoa. My name is Gayathri, and I work at the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment. I'm part of the team of policy advisors who work on this bill. Awesome. And uh, Carl said that he wasn't going to come on and introduce himself, but he's been helping us with all of the uh, Zoom technical aspects. So thank you as well for joining us. Um, so tonight, uh, we wanted to have a relatively brief explanation of the major points of the bill to kind of get everybody up to speed and to talk about anything that's changed since last year, uh, including some of the concerns that were raised during our previous session. Um, and then after that, we wanted to leave as much time as possible for you to answer, uh, for you to ask questions. Um, since we have someone from MB here to answer questions, uh, if you have any specific concerns or you're confused about any parts of the bill, you can get some authoritative answers uh, from this. Yeah. Uh, so please feel free to post questions in the text chat as you think of them. Uh, we're going to address the questions at the end after the presentation, um, but we don't want you to forget if you have something important that you want to bring up. So uh, just pop them into the chat and then we'll go through them uh, when we get to the end. Uh, so a uh, reminder for anybody that came in late, uh, the session is being recorded, including the Q&A. Uh, so just keep that in mind when you're asking questions. And uh, yeah, I think that's everything. So I'll hand it over to Guy3 to kick it off. Awesome, thank you. So this thing we are here to talk about. Um, what I propose we go through over the next half hour or so is just some background about the bill, and I'd like to take you all through the four main areas of the bill and how those will operate. Um, I'll then talk a little bit about the changes that were made to the bill after feedback from the game industry in particular, and then we'll end by going through the process and timeline from here for the bill. Um, awesome. I am going to try and whip through this. Um, let's see how we go. So the Screen Industry Workers Bill, where did this thing come from? Um, we have to go back to 2010, to the Employment Relations Film Production Work Amendment Act. Um, its more scintillating name is the Hobbit Law. Um, what this is, is the law change that was made in 2010 when the Hobbit movies were being filmed in New Zealand that changed how the employment status of people who work in the film industry is determined. So generally in New Zealand, whether you are an employee or a contractor depends on the actual nature of the relationship between you and the person who's hired you. And if you are an employee, it means you have access to things like the minimum wage, to four weeks annual leave a year, to sick leave, um, and the ability to bargain collectively. But if you're not an employee, if you're a contractor, you're treated as someone who is in business on their own account. So what this law change did in 2010 is say that for anyone who's working on a film, and um, film was defined to include games, um, your employment status is determined by the wording of the agreement you have with the person who's hired you. And if that agreement doesn't explicitly say you are an employee, then you are a contractor. So that's what happened in 2010. When there was a change of government in 2017, the incoming government said their intention was to undo the law changes that were made in 2010 there was feedback from industry that this wasn't necessarily what they wanted. So the government formed the film industry working group and tasked the working group with going away and coming up with a solution that allowed workers to continue working as contractors if that's what they wanted, but also allowed these workers to bargain collectively. So that was government's main concern. Um, the working group took about 10 months to do their work. And in 2018, they reported back to the government um, with a series of recommendations for a new workplace relations system for the screen industry. Um, the following year, the government decided to accept the film industry working group's recommendations, um, made some slight changes around the margins. The working group had said this should apply to all work in the screen industry. Um, the government decided to choose a slightly narrower definition of screen industry or work in the screen industry. And after that, the law was drafted and it was introduced to the house in 2020. I'm just going to hide our faces because my own face is distracting me. Um, 
So yes, that is where this bill has come from. Um, it is in large part a thing that gives effect to the recommendations from the film industry working group. Um, there are four main bits of the bill. The first one I want to talk about is, um, well, actually, before we get into the main bits of the work, I want to talk about whose work the bill covers. So the simple answer is contractors whose work contributes to the creation of screen productions. Um, there is some detail that sits under that very simple sentence. So under the bill, a contractor is anyone who doesn't have a written agreement or contract that says they are an employee. So if you have, um, for all workers in this industry, we recommend having a look at the actual contract you have with the person who's hired you. If that doesn't say you are an employee, then you are a contractor and the bill covers your work. So this is the only test for employment status for people who work on games, both now and under the bill. The words that are used to describe this arrangement um, don't actually matter. It's just what the contract says. The second element has to do with the type of work covered by the bill. So the bill is concerned with work that contributes to the creation um, and not to peripheral support service type work that isn't considered integral to the creative vision and purpose at the heart of a screen production. Um, the bill doesn't cover volunteer work either. And the bill doesn't cover work that is done for a company that isn't primarily in the industry. So for example, if a company were to, you know, if say their main work is creating exhibitions for museums, but they happen to um, create a documentary or a short film on the side. And if that film was a really small part of their work, they wouldn't then have to navigate two different systems for their workers. The third element of this definition has to do with what a screen production is. Um, so, Similar to the law change in 2010, this bill covers computer generated games. Um, before, when the bill was introduced, I think there was an exclusion for games that were made for educational or training purposes, but at select committee, on the basis of feedback from the industry, that exclusion was removed. So now the bill applies to all computer generated games. Um, on the film side of things, there are some key exclusions. So the bill won't apply to news and current affairs programs, it won't apply to sports and live events training and instructional programs or amateur work. And some of the thinking behind that is that um, when the law change was made in 2010, it was to it was intended to apply to work for which New Zealand tends to compete with overseas destinations um, and highly mobile capital. Um, and there was a desire not to cover work that is primarily done by employees on the film screen side of things. So if you are a contractor and if your work contributes to the creation of a game, i.e. a screen production, this bill will apply to you and your work. So the first main part of the bill has to do with individual contracts. Can I make this thing on the top be tinier? Um, possibly not. Um, anyway, so new rules for individual contracts. Um, the first so the first set of main changes made by the bill have to do with relationships between workers and the people who hire them. Um, these changes are compulsory, they're mandatory. Um, they will apply to everyone whose work is covered by the bill from the day that the bill comes into force. The first of these changes is that there will now be a duty of good faith between a worker and the person who's hired them. So. The duty of good faith is a concept that exists for employees in the employment world, um, but the bill's duty of good faith is slightly different to the one that exists for employees. And the reason for this is because there are some concepts of the employment duty of good faith that are incompatible with contractual relationships and parties' freedom to enter and cancel contracts on their own terms. So under the bill, parties to workplace relationships, i.e. or workers and the people who hire them, can't mislead or deceive each other or do anything that could mislead or deceive each other. So this is the bill's definition of good faith. Um, and once the bill comes into force, um, if parties breach this duty of good faith or you know do anything to mislead or deceive each other or that could have that effect, um, there is the possibility of a financial penalty for that behavior. The next big change that affects individual contracts is that all contracts must be in writing. Um, we are hoping this one isn't too onerous. Um, 
and there will be some procedural requirements when people are negotiating to enter into contracts or vary contracts. Um, in simple terms, these draft terms must be provided in advance. Workers must have the chance to seek independent advice on the draft terms and raise issues. And the person who's hiring the worker must respond to those issues in good faith. All individual contracts must contain certain mandatory terms under the bill. So all individual contracts have to have a term saying that parties will comply with the Health and Safety at Work Act and the Human Rights Act. All individual contracts will have to contain processes by which a worker can raise complaints of bullying, discrimination and harassment and by which those complaints will be responded to. And all individual contracts also have to include a term about how the contract will be terminated, as well as any notice and compensation associated with termination of that contract. All individual contracts must comply with any collective contract that applies to the same person's work. Um, this has to do with the collective bargaining bit of the bill, which I'll get to next. Um, and finally, when um, parties have an individual contract between them, um, an engager, i.e. a person who's hired a worker, is not allowed to terminate their co that contract in retaliation for a worker exercising any sort of right they might have under this bill or under another bill. Um, and it's intended to provide some protection to workers. So those are the basic changes that will apply to individual contracts from the day the bill comes into force. Um, I, I'm going to get into collective bargaining next. So this is the bulk of the, you know, the largeness of the bill comes from this collective bargaining framework. When we talk about collective bargaining, it's we're talking about the process by which workers come together and negotiate with their employers as a single unit to boost their bargaining power. Um, it's a process that is um, recognized under our law in New Zealand as being essential to correct the imbalance of bargaining power that would otherwise exist between a worker and their employer. Today in New Zealand, collective bargaining can only be done by employees. Employees are represented in bargaining by their unions who bargain with a single company or multiple companies and collective agreements only apply to union members. So um, this is called the principle of double affiliation. So collective agreements only apply to workers who are number one, members of the union that's negotiated a collective agreement and number two, who work for the employer that union has negotiated with. So in reality in New Zealand today, collective agreement coverage is generally quite low, particularly in the private sector. What will change under the screen industry workers bill is that contractors in the screen industry will be able to bargain collectively, either through the union or another worker organization. Um, so this is not something contractors can do at the moment because it's considered anti-competitive. The bill allows collective bargaining to take place at two different levels. So Currently, employees can only bargain at that company or enterprise level. Under the bill, contractors in the screen industry will be able to bargain collectively across the entire country with other people in the same occupation as them or within certain enterprises or productions. Um, this collective bargaining system under the bill won't apply to employees working on games, so or to any employees. The, um, the product of collective bargaining that's done under this bill will only apply to contractors. There are some basic rules that apply to all collective bargaining under the bill, regardless of which of those two levels it takes place at. The first is that all collective bargaining must be done in good faith. And there are much more detailed requirements on bargaining parties compared to just the not misleading or deceiving. For example, they have to meet regularly for bargaining, they have to consider and respond to proposals, they have to recognize the authority of each other's representatives. Um, and once bargaining is initiated, parties must conclude a collective contract. So what this means is once you've started and entered the bargaining process, you must continue negotiating until the very end and until an agreement is produced. These collective contracts will end up setting minimum terms for contractors work. Um, they are just minimum terms, so it is always possible to negotiate individual terms that are better than the ones in the collective contracts. Another key feature of the bill is that industrial action is not allowed during bargaining. So this is um, workers going on strike or engagers locking workers out. Um, this was 
an element recommended by the film industry working group. Um, the other thing that all collective bargaining will have in common under the bill is that collective contracts must contain certain mandatory terms. Um, this is the list. It is a lot more comprehensive than the list for employees. And that is because um, with employees, you already have minimum standards such as the minimum wage, holidays. Um, under the bill, it is collective contracts and specifically the ones that exist at the occupation level that are going to be doing the heavy lifting in terms of setting minimum terms. So all collective contracts will have to have terms about pay, breaks, holidays, hours of work, availability for work, termination. Um, Collective contracts will also have to set what we're calling minimum procedural requirements for those bullying, discrimination, and harassment complaints processes and dispute resolution. So what this means is um, if there is a collective contract in place and it specifies a process for bullying, discrimination, and harassment complaints, the individual contract needs to have a process that at least contains all of those elements um, and doesn't exclude anything that's in the collective contract. Collective contracts will be valid for between three to six years, unless they are for a specific production and that production has ended earlier than the three year or six year date, whatever date parties have chosen. Um, all collective contracts must include something that allows their terms to be varied. So once they are negotiated and come into force, it's not that they exist in perpetuity. The parties that have bargained them do have the ability to go back and amend them if they want to. Um, and for collective contracts that are negotiated at that occupation level, they have to include a process by which individual workers and engagers can get an exemption from the terms of that collective contract. So I'll talk a little bit more about bargaining in occupations group in occupation groups or occupation level collective bargaining, um, as the bill says. So the first thing the bill does is divide workers in the screen industry into seven different occupations. Um, there is an occupation specifically for game developers. And if you look at that little snipped image, um, the struck out text is what it used to originally say, and the underlying text is what it was changed to following feedback at, during the select committee process. So right now, the bill says anyone who works on or contributes to computer generated games and who isn't a composer, director, performer, or writer will be considered to be a game developer. So what this means is um, if you're working on a game and if you are not one of those other four occupations, um, you will all be treated as part of the same occupational group. Um, and the game developer occupation level collective contract would apply to everyone in that occupation who does that work and who hires workers who do that work across the entire country. Um, to initiate occupation level bargaining requires at least one worker organization and at least one engager organization. So a worker organization is, a, well, an example is a union, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a union. It can be a guild, basically any organization that exists for the purpose of representing workers' collective interests. Um, can register under the bill as a worker organization. Um, there also needs to be what we're calling an engager organization. So an engager organization is kind of like a union, but for engagers, it is a, an organization that serves to represent engagers collective interests. And because collective bargaining requires two parties, um, bargaining at this occupation level requires a party that represents workers as well as a party that represents engagers. Um, to initiate bargaining for an occupation level collective contract also requires there to be sufficient support on the worker's side. Um, and I say for the first time because for the first collective contract in each occupation, it, it is only workers who can initiate bargaining. What sufficient support means is just that more people want it than those who don't. So when a guild or a worker organization applies to initiate bargaining, um, this kicks off a public notice process that has a, a submissions element and um, the Employment Relations Authority will effectively count up all the workers who would be covered by that collective contract and check that more of them want bargaining to happen than don't. Um, important point, each occupation can, can only have one collective contract at a time. So 
once bargaining is initiated and is underway, that will produce a collective contract for everyone in that occupation. And until that collective contract has expired, it can't be replaced or superseded. It can be varied, but um, there can only ever be one at a time for each occupation. And the reason for this is to create a really clear landscape of minimum terms across the entire screen industry. Occupation level collective contracts have to be ratified by workers. So even if bargaining parties have come together and negotiated something um, and reached agreement between themselves, it doesn't come into force unless it is ratified by the workers who it would apply to. So what ratification requires is a simple majority of those who vote to be eligible to vote, a worker needs to have um, done that work at some point in the last three years. So this is to account for you know, the fact that people might be moving in and out of the industry, um, particularly on the film side of things. Um, there may not necessarily be regular consistent patterns of employment. So ratification is required and it is not just the members of the guild who has negotiated that contract who get to take part in ratification. It is open to all workers, non-members as well. So I briefly mentioned this earlier. It is possible for there to be exemptions from the terms of an occupation level collective contract. The film industry working group said there should only be in very exceptional circumstances. So what the bill does is set out some exceptional circumstances um, and create a process by which the parties who have negotiated that collective contract actually take responsibility for deciding on a case-by-case -case basis what is exceptional and deciding whether an exemption can be granted. Um, exemptions will always require the agreement of the worker and the engager in addition to that of signatory parties. Um, and you can get an exemption from any of the terms of a collective contract except for minimum pay rates. Those can't be derogated from or gone below at any point. So that's how the occupation level bargaining bit of the bill is intended to work. Um, I'll briefly talk about bargaining at the enterprise level as well. So when we say enterprise, we're talking a single company, a single production, um, it can be either of those. There are some differences in how these contracts are negotiated and who they apply to. So in terms of who they apply to, um, it is only work done by the worker organization members, which has negotiated it within a certain enterprise. So this type of collective bargaining looks a lot more like collective bargaining for employees today under the Employment Relations Act. Um, this is that principle of double affiliation again. If you are someone who is a member of a particular worker organization and you're working within an enterprise and there is a collective contract between that worker organization and the enterprise, um, that collective contract applies to you. Um, the other main difference between enterprise level bargaining and occupation level bargaining is that initiating this bargaining within a single production or enterprise or company requires consent from all parties to initiate bargaining. So this was another feature that was recommended by the film industry working group. Um, so similar to occupation level bargaining, there needs to be at least one worker organization because the engager needs someone to bargain with. But unlike occupation level bargaining, engagers represent themselves in bargaining. They don't need to do it through a member organization of their own. Um, they can, of course, get someone to be their bargaining agent, but because they are representing their own interests in bargaining and it's not going to apply to the work done by any other company or enterprise, they represent themselves in this sort of bargaining. Enterprise level collective contracts, just like the occupation level ones have to be ratified. Um, and again, it is the workers within coverage who need to take part in this ratification vote. So that's the members of the worker organization that's negotiated it. Um, unless it is a greenfield situation. And I'm not sure how often this would come up on the game side of things, but this effectively allows a worker organization to negotiate with a film or a particular production before they might've started work. And, hired workers. So just because there aren't already workers hired to um, take part in the ratification vote doesn't mean this type of bargaining can't happen. It just means the worker organization signs it on behalf of any of its future members who might end up working on a particular production. There can be multiple enterprise level collective contracts within a single enterprise or production. 
Um, you know, for example, there could be one for writers on a particular production. There could be one for, you know, makeup artists who do alien makeup. Um, it is entirely up to parties to decide how they want to um, not slice up or, you know, who they want these collective contracts to apply to. There is the, the bill gives non-members the ability to opt into an enterprise level collective contract. So um, you don't always have to be a member of the union or guild that's negotiated these things to be able to benefit from its minimum terms. It is possible to opt in, but that's only if the collective contract specifically says that non-members can effectively buy into the collective contract. And finally, if a worker is covered by more than one enterprise level collective contract, they can choose between them. Um, the key phrase here is for the same work. So if you were a person who wrote something as well as directed it, um, and there were two different collective contracts for writers and directors, it doesn't mean that um, you would have to choose between them. Um, the writer's one would apply when you are doing writing work, and the director's one would apply when you're doing directing. Um, it's more that if there is ever more than one for the same work, workers get a choice about which one they want. So that was a quick run through of the bargaining framework under the bill. What I will say is, and that I forgot to say earlier, is that the bargaining framework in the bill is just that it is a framework. Parties need to make active decisions and take steps to use this framework. Um, there are no consequences for not initiating bargaining. Um, in that case, the bill's provisions would just sort of lay there dormant unless someone actively took steps to use it. Um, and this is a key difference between the collective bargaining bit of the bill and the other parts of the bill, for example, that relate to individual contracts or dispute resolution. Speaking of dispute resolution, um, so the other main change made by the bill is that it introduces a standard dispute resolution process for work done by contractors in the screen industry. Um, so a key thing to remember is that this process is a default dispute resolution process. Um, it is what will apply in the absence of any agreement between parties to a contract that they want to do something else. Um, what this means is if parties want to do something different to what is in the bill, they have to be explicit about it in their individual contracts. And there are certain things that you can't contract out of. For example, if there are any activities for which the law says there is a financial penalty, um, you can't contract out of those and say someone else will decide whether or not a particular penalty applies um, that can't be contracted out of by parties. So there are three main steps in the dispute resolution process under the bill. So the first step is mediation. So um, the government will provide free mediation services, um, in fact, already does. To participate in mediation requires all parties agreement. Um, and the idea behind mediation is that with the assistance of someone who is trained to help parties resolve their problems and look underneath um, what might be causing friction on the surface to try and restore and maintain relationships where possible. Um, so this is the first step in the dispute resolution process under the bill. Um, you can't get to the next step without having at least attempted mediation. Um, but obviously, if someone wants to do mediation and someone else says no, um, there, that isn't going to be a barrier to getting to the next step in the process. So if a dispute remains unresolved after mediation, the Employment Relations Authority, which is sort of a tribunal, um, can make a determination. So determination is the language used in the authority. What this effectively is, is arbitration. It's kind of like a court decision. Um, parties go to an independent third party and that third party makes a binding decision on the problem. To apply for a determination only requires one party. So you don't need to agree to go to the authority. Um, any party in a dispute can make an application. Um, decisions of the authority can be appealed um, and this will happen in the employment court. So currently, Disputes between contractors go through the civil courts, um, sorry, go through the district court, high court, and so on. Under the bill, all work-related problems in the screen industry will come over to the employment jurisdiction and be dealt with by the Employment Relations Authority and the Employment Court. 
There are also some unique features in the bill for bargaining disputes. So in addition to the above, which is mediation determination and challenges, um, the authority can also step in after mediation to facilitate bargaining and make a recommendation to parties if they're having issues and are unable to move past them. And if that facilitation doesn't exist, the authority can make a determination. Um, but when a dispute happens during bargaining and the dispute is about what the actual term is that goes into a collective contract, the authority uses a process called final offer arbitration to decide what the term of that collective contract is going to be. So final offer arbitration is kind of like the name implies, each side puts up its final offer and then the authority chooses between one or the other. And it has a set of considerations it has to think about when it does that. Um, and it can also do this um, either by itself, so a single authority member deciding, or parties can nominate additional representatives to sit on a panel with the authority member and be part of that decision-making process. So if um, there is a dispute during bargaining and it gets to the point where the authority is having to fix terms through final offer arbitration, the collective contract still needs to go through ratification by workers before it comes into effect. So I'll talk really briefly now about changes that were made to the bill following feedback from the game industry. So the first is that the bill now covers all computer generated games. So any ge game generated by a computer where the way in which the game proceeds depends on the decisions, inputs and direct involvement of the player. Um, yeah, sometimes law language is a bit funny, but that's what it now says. Um, and there is no longer an exclusion for educational or training games. Um, the game developer definition has also been amended to capture all work on computer generated games. Um, and there were a couple of things that came up earlier that I just wanted to clarify. So the first was about dispute resolution processes. So I've already briefly talked about this. Um, the bill's processes are a default. Parties don't have to agree to use them. And in fact, if parties don't agree, the bill's processes are the ones that apply. And there are also certain steps in the dispute resolution process that can be initiated by a single party, like applying to the authority for a determination. Um, we also heard feedback about workplace access. So the bill allows for a representative from a worker organization to access workplaces where screen production work is happening in certain circumstances. Um, and this is meant to facilitate union or guild reps helping workers out with their problems um, getting their feedback to be able to put it through a collective bargaining process, for example. Um, the bill says that companies can only refuse access by a representative of a worker organization in certain circumstances. And one such circumstance is if access would prevent or temporarily stop work and that this couldn't be managed by imposing conditions on access. And I think there was a concern that the term sensitive material might um, mean that if there was any commercially sensitive information that would preclude workplace access. Um, but the way the bill is intended to operate is that if um, conditions can be placed on that access, that would mean that the access wouldn't stop or prevent work. That's not a situation in which a company can refuse access. Um, Instead, the sensitive material reference is meant to protect where nude scenes, for example, are being filmed on a film set. So I think we would all generally agree that that is one type of work that it would not be, not, you know, you wouldn't necessarily want strangers accessing a set when that sort of work was taking place. Um, all right, how are we doing for time? So what happens from here? Um, so when the bill passes, when the bill when will the bill pass is a question. Um, so the bill is currently awaiting what is called second reading. It has a few more stages in the lawmaking process to go through before it becomes law. So this includes committee of the whole house where parliament can make final changes to the bill. After the bill passes, it will come into force three months um, later. And from day one, all existing contracts will be subject to the new duties and obligations other than that requirement for mandatory terms. But all new contracts from that date onwards have these new duties and obligations, as well as the requirement to have those mandatory terms I talked about earlier. 
What can also happen from day one is that worker and engager organizations can register under the bill and take steps to initiate bargaining. So one year after the bill comes into force, that is when existing contracts, i.e. contracts that already were in place before the law came into force, have to fully comply with the new law. So this means they must be amended to include the new mandatory terms. So there is a 12 month period for workers and engagers to do that sort of negotiation and make sure contracts are up to scratch. Um, so we also get asked about the timing for collective bargaining. Ultimately, it, um, it depends. We can't say for certain when collective contracts will come into force because it depends on you know, whether organizations that can do collective bargaining already exist or need to be formed. Um, it depends on how detailed bargaining gets and, and you know, how bargaining proceeds. But once an occupation level collective contract is negotiated, it's been ratified and it's been sent to MB for publication, it comes into effect six months later. So all new contracts entered into from that six month date will have to meet the minimum terms set in the occupation level collective contract. Any contract that existed before that six month date gets an additional six months. So effectively a year to make sure that they meet all the terms set out in the occupation level collective contract. Um, and the bill also, um, there is a mechanism in the bill that is intended to prevent people having to go back and amend contracts too often every time a collective co contract comes into force. So when a collective contract comes into force, if it sets a particular term at a more favorable level for workers than what is already in their individual contracts, the term in the individual contract just gets read over by the one in the collective contract. Um, yep. So for more information about the bill, um, you can go to our MB website. Um, you can also follow the bill's progress and sign up for alerts on the parliament website and read the text of the bill on the legislation website. Um, I will also do a plug for Employment New Zealand. So Employment New Zealand will contain more detailed information about the bill when it passes, as well, it mean, as, well as what it means for people in the industry. But more importantly, um, Employment New Zealand offers free services and support to people to help resolve problems. This includes a triage early resolution type service, as well as all those mediation services I talked about earlier. So Employment New Zealand is there to help. Um, so that's the end of my spiel. Michael, do you want to do questions? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so really quick uh, before we roll into Q&A, um, now that you all kind of have an overview of how the bill works, I did want to take another quick, again, anonymous poll. Um, we wanted to see how many of you have an interest in joining a worker organization if there was one for games. And we're also looking to see uh, if you'd be interested in having that organization negotiate a collective agreement that would cover you. Obviously, it was a fairly large portion of the presentation. So we just kind of want to see if people will actually be interested in using those portions of the bill in our industry, because we don't have a history of unionization here. Um, so yeah, so if you can just fill that out, um, we're not signing up to anything, it's all anonymous. So it's just to gauge interest in, and everything for that. Um, so yeah, so we can just roll into q and It looks like there were quite a few questions. So Chelsea, if you want to give us the first one. Yeah, sure. So I got a couple in my DMs and I'll go through the ones in the chat too. Um, the first question is, is there a time limit on collective bargaining? So there is no time limit on collective bargaining, but if one party tried to drag collective bargaining on forever, that would probably be a breach of the good faith rules for collective bargaining. So another party would be able to trigger steps like mediation facilitation going to the authority. That kind of leads into another question somebody had, which was, does the bill say what options apply if there is no decision on mediation? Like the employer doesn't say yes or no, but just delays decision making. Um, so the bill doesn't say it, but in practice, what would happen is you would just go to the authority in that case. Um, and I think that counts as having attempted mediation that you've tried. Awesome. Uh, next question is, are there fairly clear guidelines around who as a contractor is considered peripheral or is this up to individual employers? So there aren't clear guidelines. And the reason for that is because if we tried to define this um, in really clear terms, we would probably set the boundary somewhere inappropriate. So ultimately it is going to be four parties to decide 
whether the work that is done is considered peripheral to the actual creation of a screen production. There are some examples in the bill of the types of services that might be considered peripheral, um, such as accounting, admin, advertising, auditing, legal services. But this doesn't mean that in every case, these types of work will be considered peripheral. Um, for example, if you were a production accountant, I think people would say that's pretty integral to whether something can be created. Um, so would it be considered peripheral? So the long, the short answer is it depends. Um, it will come down to common sense. And if people disagree and don't agree, um, that's what the dispute resolution processes are there for. Awesome. Um, what is the understanding of screen industry professionals who also service the games industry on a regular basis as a cross function and a part of their core service offerings? How does the bill cater for that? So I guess the main way the bill caters for that is through the delineation into the different occupational groups. Um, so when doing work that ultimately leads to the creation of a game that would be covered by any collective contract that applies to game developers, but any other work would fall into one of the other occupations on the non-game side of the industry. I'm not sure if that was the question. but It kind of leads <laughs> okay. nicely into the next question, which is, can I be represented by any union or only a union of programmers? Um, so unions and guilds sometimes have membership rules. So first they might say who is entitled to join them. Um, and based on who their members are, they then have the ability to participate in collective bargaining to represent those members. Um, so I think I might be able to go out and join some of the unions that don't have really strict membership rules, even if I don't do any of that work. But if that union had no interest in representing policy advisors and collective bargaining with my employer, that would mean that practically I would never gain the benefit of any collective bargaining that union may engage in. So and once that, once like if policy, if say there's a policy advisors union that creates a policy advisor co contract, that contract applies to all po policy advisors who work as contractors, correct? Yes. Yeah, so in the, under the screen industry workers bill, um, any worker organization that has at least one member within coverage of a particular occupation. So one member who is in a particular occupation, so one game developer member, um, that union or guild would be able to participate in bargaining for the game developer collective contract. Um, because, so what the bill does is ask worker and engager organizations to register. And the act of registering means all these organizations go into a little pool. And whenever occupation level bargaining is initiated, the parties for bargaining get drawn from within that pool based on whose members would be affected by the collective contract that is produced at the very end. Um, you could get some fringe cases where a particular union or guild may just have one member who does certain work. Um, and the bill does allow in those cases for that organization to say, this isn't really our business. Um, there is a much more obviously representative body here. Can we not be party to this collective contract, that's fine. They can ask to be removed from bargaining, but that one member of theirs would still be bound ultimately by the resulting collective contract. Excellent. Um, the next question is, is there any obligation on a contractor to belong to a collective? At the enterprise level, no. At the occupation level, um, kind of because the occupation level collectives con collective contracts will apply to absolutely all work that is done by people in that group and everyone who hires people in that group. But so it effectively will create a set of minimum terms for all game development work. We are expecting that because this coverage is so wide and universal that the terms are going to be quite, well, Let's just say I'm not expecting these things to run to like 50 pages. They are going to be quite high level, bare bones. It really is about setting that absolute base upon which the enterprise level collective contracts and individual contracts can build. Um, and it is possible to set differentiated minimum terms as well. Yeah. The next question is a situational one. Ooh. So it says, what, what, what would happen in the following situation? 
A project begins and the initial contractors negotiate collective bargaining agreements. Then more contractors join. Those post-collective agreement contractors can choose to join the agreement or not join the agreement. Can they try to negotiate their own collective bargaining agreement if one is already in place? So within a single enterprise, it is possible to negotiate a different one. So ultimately, um, if I showed up to a place and there was already a collective contract, I didn't particularly want it. It, it wouldn't apply to me if I just never joined the union or guild that it negotiated the contract or if I never chose to opt in. Um, and if I wanted a different one, I could get together with some other people, create a different worker organization or possibly even get the same worker organization to negotiate a different enterprise level collective contract. It all comes down to what the collective contract says in what we call its coverage clause. So each enterprise collective contract will have to say, this applies to X type of work and there needs to be a description of the work. Um, and then that double affiliation principle applies. So whoever is a member of the guild and whoever works for that engager and does the work specified in that coverage clause. So, you know, within a single enterprise, can't answer definitively, but it is highly likely that you would be able to negotiate a different one or just not join the union or guild if you didn't want to be covered by it. But that's not true for occupation level agreements. No. It's only true at the enterprise level. Yep. Um, does any of this cover contracts with companies that are outside of New Zealand? So this law will only apply to work done in New Zealand. So if the work is done here, but for a company that's based overseas, the law would apply to it. But um, as a rule, countries generally don't really make laws that apply beyond their territorial boundaries. So this won't apply to work that's done outside New Zealand. Can you clarify the scope of the roles, uh, for instance, game developer versus some of the more specific roles like programmer or artist? So all of those roles would probably fall within the game developer bucket. So the idea is if you work on a game and if you are not a writer, composer, performer or what was the other one a director so if you're not one of those other four things and you work on a game you are considered a game developer under the bill and the reason for that is because writers directors all of those things are covered under the subsequent film guilds yeah so they're separate occupational groups for those other four groups of workers for the composers directors performers and writers could there be a situation where a contract applies to you and you don't know it Technically, an occupation level collective contract, but um, we suspect the nature of the industry, both the game side and the film side of things, means that it's probably not going to be unknown to many people in the industry. So when bargaining is about to be initiated, there is a public submission process and we expect the parties trying to initiate bargaining will be getting workers to take part in the submissions process, make their views heard, and at the very end, of bargaining, the collective contracts get published online. Um, so, I mean, really, given the size of the industry and the way everyone seems to know each other, um, we're expecting that practically people will know about these things. Um, and hopefully over time, it gets to a point where people coming into the industry have an expectation that there will be minimum terms for their work and that they know where to find these minimum terms as well. Excellent. Ooh, this next one. Does the bill do anything to protect people from bullying that is not legally considered harassment? Oof. Um, this is a big policy debate, this one. Um, so what the bill does is almost put some procedural scaffolding around the existing processes that exist relating to bullying. So Workplace bullying is prohibited under the Health and Safety at Work Act, depending on the definition of bullying. Um, bullying in some cases can also contravene the Human Rights Act. What the bill does is draw people's attention to this and require that everyone has processes in place for dealing with these issues. And over time, for example, collective contracts could end up setting best practice in terms of what is considered bullying and how different types of bullying should be dealt with. 
um, and the relationship between collective contracts and individual contracts means that over time these things can flow through from the collective to the individual but on its own the bill doesn't change what is considered bullying under either of those other acts the health and safety at work act or the human rights act awesome all right i'm down to the last one perfect oh. timing yeah. um how do enterprises in the industry feel about this regulation? Union representation in private markets is low. How does this regulation help to develop the game development industry? Oh my God, that was like five questions. <laughs> <laughs> it's a Last collective one. thought, perhaps. Um, <laughs> first, as someone who works for MB, I would not speculate on what is in the heads of companies or enterprises. Um, I think it is quite telling that the film industry working group included representatives of, so on the film side of things, included representatives of various production companies and the Screen Production and Development Association, which represents producers. Um, and everyone signed up to those recommendations unanimously. I think there was a view that this was, um, you know, that this was a deal in and of itself, that um, it would give companies the certainty they were looking for in terms of their workers' employment status um, and on the other side, it would give workers the ability to bargain collectively at these two different levels and set minimum terms. So that's that answer. Um, what was the other bit of it? The second half was how does the regulation help to develop the game industry? Hmm. So that's straying a little bit into political territory, but I think the idea is that over time, this will um, allow game industry as well as the film industry to improve worker protection in a way that benefits all parties in the industry and that response to the unique nature and circumstances of the industry. Excellent. All right, we got one more. Um, how are <laughs> minimum terms defined? How will I know if my individual, oops, sorry, contract would be in breach of an occupational level agreement? Oof. Um, so the bill has like a page and a half about what each of those minimum terms means. So what counts as a minimum pay rate, what counts as a this or that. Um, and practically we are hoping that just reading some things side by side makes it clear whether something's in contravention or not. Um, if in doubt, we would probably recommend that workers go to the guild or union that's negotiated that collective contract. They will know it best and be able to answer any questions um, and if not, that's what the dispute resolution process is there for as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. This has been super helpful. Um, we have in our, um, for everyone who's on the um, webinar, we have a Slack channel that's dedicated to this conversation. So if after spending the night kind of pondering all of this, feel free to join the conversation. And thank you so much, Guy3, for your, for your presentation and for answering all of our questions. All good. Thanks for having me. <laughs>